chest physician for the Network for Physiology Pulmonary Function Rehabilitation. They can be found there. Also, they're free of charge uh, to any, everyone uh, that wants to look at them. Uh, when you go to the ACCP website, just go to the networks. Under the Physiology and Pulmonary Function Network, you'll find them there. Okay. Before we start talking about our reading exercise tests, there's one basic principle we all have to remember, and that is the Fick equation. Remember that from physiology and medical school? Well, the Fick equation describes everything that can go wrong in an exercise test as far as disease states. <coughs> It basically tells us the oxygen consumption, and that's what we're really measuring throughout the test here. Uh, the goal is to try to get people to their highest maximum consumption, oxygen consumption possible. That is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. And then you take that number times the arterial oxygen content minus the mix of venous O2. Now, the arterial oxygen content can affect the VO2 by anything that causes lung disease, it causes hypoxemia, it's going to lower the oxygen content. COPD, ILD, anemia can lower the oxygen content in the arterial blood. Shunts, claudication. The mixed venous O2, that's, we don't see problems with that that often, but when they do occur, they're related to problems with oxygen consumption, like diseases of metabolism, things like different types of mitochondrial myopathies, neurologic diseases, and that sort of thing. Now, we, know, we need to know what happens normally in an exercise test before you can really know what's abnormal. When a normal person reaches their peak exercise, what limits a normal person is the heart. They reach a cardiac limit. That's one of the reasons cardiologists, when they do tests like stress tests and things, they like to get the patient up to 90% of their maximum predicted heart rate if possible to know they have a really good test or peak. They've reached a peak value. When a normal person reaches their maximum uh, heart limitation, they usually have about 25 to 30 percent of their normal ventilatory reserve remaining at that limit. Now, keeping that in mind, in patients that are athletes or elderly, well fit, or fit individuals, uh, they can actually push on past their cardiac limit and just keep working and working and working, making themselves more and more acidotic, increasing their ventilation to actually get to their ventilatory limits. Now, for today's discussion, there's two types of exercise abnormalities we're going to talk about. We're going to first talk about evaluating for pulmonary limitations, things like ventilatory mechanical limitations, falls into three categories, dead space or hyperventilation problems, or diffusion or hypoxemic problems. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't work my pointer. Okay. And then, after that, we're going to talk about everything else. Okay. Uh, it falls into the category of cardiac problems, whether it's pump, ischemic, conduction abnormalities. Uh, problems with oxygen delivery, like anemia, or possibly claudication, obstruction to the flow, uh, to the, the uh, periphery of the muscles. And uh, lastly, patients that have oxygen consumption problems, like metabolic, myopathic, and neuropathic. Now, so let's talk about those three pulmonary limitations. How do we determine if a patient has a mechanical limitation? Well, one of the ways we can do this is we can have the patient perform an MVV. We don't do that way very often here just because we don't do very good MVVs. Uh, they tend to really underestimate it. So we find it's a little more accurate if we actually uh, take the FEV1 times 40. Some literature takes the FEV1 times 41, sometimes times 35, uh, but uh, usually this is felt to be the more popular one. We take that number, FEV1 times 40, and we find out what, find out what that patient's actual mechanical limitation will be. Now, this may overestimate the MVV, however, in diseases like myasthenia. You know, it's a disease where you start breathing hard, you tend to fatigue pretty quickly. And in that situation, it probably is better to have the lab do an MVV ahead of time. Just make sure they really you let them know it's really important to get the best possible one you can get. Okay, now if a subject is within 25% of that value, or greater than 75% of you figure out what is predicted for them, they're starting to exhaust their ventilatory reserve. If they get within 10% of that number, they pretty much reach their ventilatory mechanical limits, and you can call them mechanically limited. Now, the FEV1 times 40 estimates, they're really not very accurate in patients that have severe restriction. Those patients can have respiratory rates up in the 50s, and yet when you do that calculation, they may only be about 50, 50 to 60 percent of their calculated MVV. Uh, and that's because this calculation is based on normal people that are normally able to increase their tidal volume like they're supposed to, increase their respiratory rate like they're supposed to. 
uh, take the uh, more time to do there. Uh, patients that are like super restricted, uh, they're just going to keep their vital tidal volume the same, keep breathing faster and faster and faster, and as a result, this calculation may really look like they have a lot of ventilatory reserve when they don't. So if they have a respiratory rate in the 50s with a 30 to 40 percent ventilatory reserve left over, again, you can say that they're probably mechanically restricted because they're just breathing so fast. Now, it's also important to uh, uh, examine the patterns of the respiratory rate and the tidal volume. For example, if a patient with severe COPD, <clears throat> this is an example where the patient in blue, their tidal volume continues to go up. This, the respiratory rate goes up. And then when they start getting acidotic at AT and they start breathing really fast, their tidal volume starts to fall. This is a pretty classic tracing of a patient that has dynamic hyperinflation from COPD. On the opposite end of the spectrum, patients with restrictive lung disease. This is a patient here whose tidal volume just pretty much stays flat throughout the exercise test. And look at the respiratory rate, though. This is going up a soft scale of 40. It's getting up in the 50s and 60s at this point. So examining the patterns can be very helpful also. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the second category of pulmonary limitations, and that's what we call the gas exchange abnormalities. Now, Dr. Lazar gave pretty much an entire lecture on this one here. Uh, when we look at the VE to VCO2, we call that the ventilatory equivalence for CO2. Now, to see why this ratio is, ratio is useful in exercise testing, we have to look at the equation for the relationship, this equation for the relationship of the minute ventilation to VCO2 in dead space. This can be found in pretty much any physiology textbook, uh, and uh, they go through the derivation, which really isn't that difficult. It looks kind of complicated here, but really the derivation is not that difficult when they step through it. <clears throat> Less uh, textbook has a really good uh, uh, elaboration on this. <clears throat> now, notice that the equation for minute ventilation also contains the variable for uh, uh, CO2 production and also the VDVT. So we see this ratio, or these numbers are already in here. So what we do is a little algebraic manipulation here to get the VDVT over on this side of the equation and get this, these two values over on the other side. And lo and behold now, we see that the VCO2 to VE is related to the VDVT. It, it's the inverse. So because it's the inverse, as this number increases, which down here would mean it's decreasing because it's a flip-flop of it, as the minimum ventilation gets higher in relation to VCO2. Now because, as this number now, the VE is getting higher, this is shrinking. Because you're subtracting from one, it's making this whole side of the equation a bigger number, which means the VDVT is increasing as the VE to VCO2 rises. Now, we have to keep in mind, though, that one other thing makes the VE VCO2 go up, and that's hyperventilation. Now, in hyperventilation, you see the same equation again, the PaCO2 will decrease proportionally to the increase in minute ventilation, in a normal person and keeps the VDVT the same. So if you really want to find out if this increase VE to VCO2 is related to hyperventilation, you need an ABG. Okay? Uh, because if the PaCO2 remains pretty much the same as this number changes, well, that's going to make that go up or look like uh, that's how you separate that there's actually dead space versus hyperventilation. Make sense to everybody? Good. Okay. Now, when we record the VEVCO2, there's a lot of different ways of recording it. We do it differently than cardiologists. A lot of articles out there. Arguably, the most accurate way is to measure this number as a spot value at anaerobic threshold. Uh, you'll see that the cardiology reports often talk about the, uh, the VE to VCO2 slope. What they're doing is actually recording that number, the entire slope from rest all the way up to peak. Um, Dr. Lazar, not to go through that, I'm sure his lecture was recorded. He goes through an entire lecture on that, why you can run into a lot of problems doing that uh, from the pulmonary standpoint. It's used very often in studies with chronic congestive heart failure, and it's very useful there, but you've got to be careful kind of taking that slope, using that with other entities. Uh, the reason we record it at anaerobic threshold is because a lot of patients have trouble getting further on in exercise. They have different peak levels past AT. Anaerobic threshold uh, is a point when they start now breathing more in response to their metabolic demands rather than because of their discomfort. You know, the seat hurts, they're scared, this other thing. Once they start hitting anaerobic threshold, now they're breathing 
because of their physiology rather than because of their, their uh, discomfort. Now, third thing we talk about from the pulmonary standpoint is diffusion abnormalities. And when we talk about that, we're not talking about the pulmonary function definition. We're talking about the physiologic definition, which is the ability of oxygen to passively exchange across the lung surface. We measure this by oximetry, preferably ear or forehead over finger. You know, finger, a lot of times patients, as they get tired, they start gripping really hard, and it makes the number pretty inaccurate. Okay. A decrease in oxygen saturation of greater than or equal to 4% is considered significant. Uh, now, it's not unusual in fit elderly subjects to drop their saturation more than 4%. That's normal if they reach peak exercise. Not normal if you only get to 50% of your VO2. If you get to that peak value, that is normal, but it still should not fall below 90%. Now, the other caveat to this is if a patient does have an anaerobic threshold that turns out to be reduced, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and the oxygen saturation is still greater than 90%, then you cannot blame that reduced anaerobic threshold on the patient's being hypoxic. Because again, a patient can't get enough oxygen, it's going to make their AT occur a lot lower, uh, going to anaerobic metabolism. Now, so we talked about the three types of pulmonary limitation. The ventilatory mechanical, which is related to pulmonary limitations such as obstruction, ILD, or fibrosis, but also keep in mind chest wall restriction can do it, like kyphoscoliosis type conditions, neurologic conditions that cause neuromuscular weakness, they can also do it. Predicted values, uh, you measure the MVV, or you can either take the FEV1 times 40. The abnormalities that can occur in gas exchange, uh, a lot more complex, it's a lot more non-specific than the other entities. Uh, Patients that actually have increased dead space ventilation in the lung can raise it, but we also showed you how hyperventilation can do it. You need to have an arterial CO2 to really decide if that's the case. Metabolic diseases can also cause patients to hyperventilate. We all know patients with like bad liver disease. We sit there watching them breathe like a locomotive, and not necessarily due to acidosis, due to other metabolic toxins. Um, patients with cardiac pump failure, this number goes up also. Usually that's because of abnormalities in dead space ventilation that are occurring. Uh, yeah, let me go back up again here. Um, pulmonary hypertension. This is one of the conditions that tends to go a lot higher than in other conditions. It's for a couple of reasons. One is they do have abnormalities of dead space ventilation. Uh, there's also a hyperventilatory response that we don't really understand. We've mentioned it a few times in this conference before. Uh, it's not clear if it's because they just get so much more acidotic than other patients do, like heart failure and other things, or is there some kind of metabolic drive that a pulmonary hypertension patient has that's driving the ventilation that hard, something going on in the lungs, hormonal thing, who the heck knows. Uh, it's not been studied yet, but it's a really good project for someone to do. Uh, I know just my personal experience, I don't buy the acidosis thing myself just because when we do put heart lines in these people, their lactates go up to 9 or 10, just like everybody else would do. They don't have to run 14 or 15, so I have a hard time explaining it just because they have more acidosis. But it's something that shouldn't be too hard to study, but of course it'll be something invasive with our lines. Um, classically, these are patients that in the latter stages of pulmonary hypertension, it's one of the few conditions where they're entitled CO2, and we do show those on the graphs, will actually go down from rest to AT. Everyone after AT goes down again, but from rest to AT, that's one of the few conditions where the entitled CO2 falls rather than, than going up. Uh, predicted values. We do calculate predicted values based on age, sex, race, things like that. But if you have somebody basically that's less than 35 at 18, you know they're going to be abnormal. Uh, we'll talk about the specifics a little bit later in the lecture. Okay. Now, uh, normal people, however, can get as high as 40 at peak exercise well past AT. And that's going to become important later on, too. We talk about cardiac causes because they're going to tell us that a VEVCO2 slope of less than, uh, higher than 35 means you're going to die uh, in congestive heart failure, whereas normal people can achieve numbers well above 35 up to the 40 range. Okay. Uh, diffusion problems, basically usually lung problems, ILD, emphysema. Even high altitude can do that. Interesting about high altitude, it's literally doing the same thing as uh, ILD for diffusion because the partial pressure is so low, diffusion slows down, whereas an ILD, diffusion also slows down, but just because you have thickening of the alveolar membranes. But altitude is kind of a similar phenomenon. 
Okay, predicted values, we already mentioned, you have to have an O2 sat for normal to be less than 4% drop. Uh, if the O2 sat is less than 90%, then uh, hypoxemia may be a limiting factor. Now, just to show you on the reports who aren't familiar with these when they get uploaded into to EPIC now, uh, for the pulmonary parameters, notice up here we kind of classify pulmonary parameters. We're going to show you the VO2. Predicteds are going to be based on age, sex, height, and weight. They're going to vary. Uh, the minute ventilation, uh, we're going to take the FEV1 times 40. If there's a post-dilator test done, we're going to use that FEV1. Unfortunately, on the reports, I cannot put that number in here, so this is the pre. But if there's a post-test in the interpretation, we'll always mention what the post value is and that we use that one instead. It becomes important if you have exercise-induced bronchospasm, because your post-FEV1 is going to be lower, and you might show a mechanical ventilatory limitation with that than uh, using the pre-number. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Say that again here. The, the four letters that are after many ventilation. I'll just measure barometric, that, that standard temperature, pressure, and all that other stuff. It's one of the conversion factors. As opposed to S, T, P, S, and there's about three or four different ways. They're just letting you report knowing which one, you know, they're adjusting to. Um, B stands, actually, that stands for body temperature. Yeah, body temperature and, and whatever. So they're adjusting, since it's done in a machine, at a certain temperature, then they readjust the body temperature and it changes by just a little bit. And if I knew you were going to ask that, I would have read the actual, what the acronym stood for. <laughs> but it is an adjustment for body temperature versus room temperature, is what it is. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to show you the oxygen saturation uh, at rest, AT, and peak. We'll show you what the predicted value actually is for that age and adjusted equation. Uh, also, it's going to be important to look at the respiratory rate. How high did it go? A peak exercise. Where did it start? The tidal volume. This patient here couldn't even double his tidal volume at this point. Um, most patients can do two to three times that. And again, it becomes important to look at the graphs we talked about. Okay, so now let's jump to the non-pulmonary limitations. Uh, first, we have to understand the anaerobic threshold. What is anaerobic threshold? Uh, anaerobic threshold is the VO2 above which there's a supply, demand, and balance of the oxygen in the muscles. As a result, there's a net increase in the lactate to pyruvate ratio. That excess lactate is buffered by bicarb to CO2 and water. Typical equation we see for that. Once it, uh, it buffers, binds to C CO uh, H2 and CO3, carbonic anhydrase, which is in the red cells, will then convert it to water and CO2. And then the body tries to eliminate the excess of CO2 by increasing the amount of ventilation. Now, an important concept to understand here is that VO2 and work are linear. It doesn't matter uh, if you're normal or if you have congestive heart failure, it's still going to be linear. A lot of people under the misconception when you reach anaerobic threshold, this graph changes. But oxygen consumption is linear. Even once you get past the anaerobic threshold, it doesn't decrease. You start producing lactate, but oxygen still keeps going up linearly. Okay. The V-stone method is probably the most popular way of identifying anaerobic threshold out there in the real world. Um, it's still recommended in most textbooks. It's not as accurate as the ventral equivalence method I'm going to show you. But I don't know. You know, if you look at the, I think I got this out of Wasserman's te textbook a while back. If you look at this graph here, you know, yeah, it kind of looks good when they put the dotted lines on here. Said, oh, yeah, it looks like AT. But really, if you didn't have the dotted line there, I might be tempted to make this line here straight, and then this, the other after it changes. So this is going to end up crossing way up here. And so I just, I have a hard time using this method. And I think a lot of people do, and I think a lot of people tend to overestimate uh, AT because of that. Now, the ventilatory equivalence method for identifying AT, by definition, is the lowest point uh, on the graph before it starts to rise. The reason it does this is because uh, the reason the ratio it goes, now remember, since oxygen consumption is linear with work, that means, and we're measuring VO2 here, any change in the shape of this is caused by the numerator, the minute ventilation. So in other words, during early exercise, as a patient's like, it's not even a patient, let's say you're walking around the hallway here, you're using your leg muscles, your oxygen consumption is going up fairly dramatically at that point, but you're not breathing hard yet, I might be breathing hard yet, but you guys shouldn't be breathing hard yet. So as a result, the ratio actually falls early in exercise. Okay. Now, as soon as you hit anaerobic threshold, you start producing lactate, the minute ventilation picks up right away, and then it starts driving it in the other direction. 
So this is actually the gold standard for measuring uh, anaerobic threshold. Now what I like to do is superimpose four graphs that distinctly change their shape at AT. We already showed you the ventilatory equivalence, one in blue here, for oxygen, gold standard. Okay. We also look at the ventilatory equivalence for CO2, VEVCO2. That's the red graph. This is obviously an artificial one I created to make it look really good. Okay. But in the red graph, what will happen at AT, it falls just like uh, the, the, the ventilatory equivalence for oxygen. But at AT, it has a little flat phase it goes through. We call that isocaptic ventilation, and that's before it starts to go north like the other graphs. What's happening here is because the lungs have some buffering ability, that as you reach anaerobic threshold, your ventilation picks up, you're able to eliminate the CO excess CO2 that's made. However, if you go a little bit further, eventually the degree of acidosis just overwhelms the ability of the lungs to compensate. So again, the ventilation starts to rapidly take off here. The respiratory quotient, that's in turquoise. Remember, we're looking here at the production of CO2 divided by the oxygen consumption. This is measured at the mouth and tidal breaths, and again, kind of makes sense as you get to anaerobic threshold, the vertical line here, that uh, uh, ventilation picks up, and that graph starts to go north also. And lastly, we put the tidal O2 on there. That's up a little bit higher, and what that does at anaerobic threshold is that will start to rise. A little counterintuitive there, if you think about it. Most of the times I ask the fellow, what happens to the tidal O2 at AT? They say it goes down. Well, the reason it, does, it goes up is because as the patient's pH decreases, it makes the minute ventilation increase because of the acidosis. And as a result of that, it drives down the alveolar CO2. Now remember, we're measuring breaths at the mouth. So at the end tidal breath, you're measuring what's coming out of the alveoli. Now, to maintain one atmosphere of pressure between the mouth and the alveoli, because your mouth is wide open, uh, you don't have a negative pressure down there, okay? As that alveolar CO2 is now being blown off, alveolar hypocapnia, uh, because you have to have one atmosphere down the alveoli, there's only three gases down there, CO2, oxygen, and nitrogen. Well, 80% nitrogen is in the air. It's still 80% down in the alveoli because the body doesn't use nitrogen. It doesn't go anywhere. It just kind of stays there. So that means as the CO2, alveolar CO2 decreases, the alveolar O2 has to increase the PO2 increases, which makes the tidal O2 start to rise. Make sense? If not, it's on the video. Okay. Now, we choose a line that goes through all four of those points, and if, we, if the line does go through those four points, pretty much have a slam dunk, you picked AT correctly. If it doesn't go through half these points, then you may have a problem and you have to go back and look again. This is actually what it looks like in real life. Uh, this is an actual patient here that we drew a line through AT because this is where the VEVO2 starts to, hits its lowest point and it starts to go up. This is where the point of isocaptic ventilation goes flat before it starts going up again over here. The respiratory quotient, we see here it's kind of bouncing around, but this is the point that actually starts to go up also. And then up here, the end tidal O2 starts to rise. So we drew a line through there, and this is one we happen to get lucky on. Now keep in mind though, the more the more abnormalities there are on pulmonary function tests, the greater there is, the more distortion there is, and it gets a little bit harder to do this, and you have to do a little gestalting of the uh, graphs at that point. So now, is the anaerobic threshold reduced? AT is reported as the VO2 at AT divided by the predicted maximum VO2 times 100. In other words, it's a percent of their predicted maximum they achieve. Okay. Predicted VO2s are really very, I mean, if you look at the different regressions equations out there by different authors, they're all over the map sometimes, and it depends on the population studied and their degree of fitness. Obviously, you do a test like this, and people live in the mountains of Bulgaria that climb up and down the mountain to shop every day like five miles, they're going to have predicted values a heck of a lot higher than you or I have. Uh, okay. If you have an AT less than 40% of predicted uh, VO2 max, that's always going to be abnormal. However, you have to keep in mind that starting at the age of 25 to 30 years of age, for every 10 years you increase in age, that lower limit of norm is going to go up by about 2%. So the time you get to your mid-70s, it's going to be around 50%. Uh, we do adjust for that, have regression equations based on the age to tell you the lower limit of normal. Now, both AT and VO2 max, part of the reason that the ratio goes up to 50% is because both AT and VO2 max decrease with age, 
but the predicted value goes down faster than the predicted anaerobic threshold, so that makes the ratio start to rise. In other words, AT stays relatively more constant through aging than your predicted maximum value. Now, once you've established you have a reduced VO2, or I'm sorry, reduced anaerobic threshold, that's a very non-specific finding. It can happen in just about anything. So once you've established that, you have to start going through the algorithms in your mind. What are the possible causes here? Exercise tests cannot be examined or interpreted by themselves. You have to know clinical history, and that's why the fellows always make sure that they have reviewed the chart, they know what's going on, because you can help that ordering doctor eliminate a lot of the things that may not be going on, instead of just putting out a differential that includes 12 things every time you have an abnormal value. Now, I tell them to think about it. Once that AT is low, pretend you're a red blood cell, start off in the left ventricle, and start swimming around the entire body all the way on the circulation to come back to the heart again. And think about all the things along that stepwise pathway that can make your AT reduce. For example, we know about all the heart things, you know, myocardial, valvular type things, pump factor things, ischemia, conduction problems. As you get out of the circulation, ischemic problems, you know, claudication can decrease delivery of oxygenated blood to the tissues. Anemia can do the same thing. A really low hemoglobin is obviously going to reduce your oxygen consumption, can make your AT low if it's low enough. You get onto the muscles, a lot of things out there can impair your oxygen consumption, different metabolic diseases, myopathic disorders, neurologic diseases, okay? Uh, we come back over now into the venous side, coming back towards the heart again. Uh, impaired venous return sometimes, you have thrombotic disease that's bad enough, it's going to also uh, can impair your oxygen consumption. And organ disease, uh, Renal hepatic diseases, again, might not just be from acidosis. They can produce a lot of metabolic toxins. As a result of that, it can alter your muscle metabolism of oxygen and lower your AT. Uh, pulmonary vascular diseases, popular one here, okay. That can lower your AT, or your AT for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it can affect, it plug up your pulmonary vessels, uh, causing hypoxemia uh, for VQ mismatching or just decreasing blood flow. It can affect the right ventricle. Uh, bad enough that now it compresses the septum, so it impairs your left ventricular output as well. So that's, what, that's one of the real notorious ones. Okay, then we get up back into the lungs now. We have to think about all the pulmonary parenchymal causes there, ILDs, uh, fibrosis. Again, the causes of decrease the VO2 and parenchymal diseases, for the most part, is because of hypoxemia. Whereas these other diseases, it's usually due to other causes of oxygen consumption. And then the very last point, we can't forget about that little stretch of blood vessel between the lungs and the heart, the pulmonary veins. And after 30 years, I'm still looking to find my first pulmonary venoocclusive veno disease. I haven't found one yet, but I keep looking. Uh, but they do exist, and that, will, can, that can be a really interesting, on exercise tests, everything looks fine, but this thing kind of goes into, the, into the, uh, the garbage. The AT is like super low. As I said, I've never seen one yet, but I keep looking for one. Okay. Now, another number we look at commonly is the O2 pulse. That's the VO2 divided by the heart rate, which is a reflection of stroke volume. Why is it a reflection of stroke volume? Well, here comes that old thick equation again. And uh, what we say here is, of course, we already established that the cardiac output is equal to the stroke volume times the heart rate. But we also know that most people, the arterial oxygen content minus the mixed venous content remains relatively constant throughout exercise. So we make that a constant. As a result of that now, we can say that the VO2 is proportional to the stroke volume times the heart rate times a K that we're eliminating here. Okay. We do a little bit of algebra again. We divide each side by heart rate. And look what we got. We've now got the VO2 over the heart rate is proportional to the stroke volume, which is O2 pulse. Now, normal graphs, a normal graph, we show this on the reports also, one of the last pages. We see the O2 pulse here in a normal person with a heart rate. And when the O2 pulse reaches their maximum predicted value of oxygen consumption, you know it's normal. And you should, at a good test, see the O2 pulse just starts to plateau because that patient has now reached their stroke volume limitation as their heart rate goes up and reaches their predicted maximum value. In patients with pump limitation, the O2 pulse will predict, will pull, oh, yeah, try that again. The O2 pulse will plateau at a reduced VO2 showing you, wow, you know, the patient's got a stroke volume, their oxygen consumption is low, and that O2 pulse or stroke volume is plateauing a lot sooner than it should, while the heart rate progressively goes up. So it kind of shows you there's a stroke volume limitation. 
in a more extreme case, kind of saw one of Sarah's patients a while back, was that in pump failure, here's a patient where the O2 pulse or stroke volume goes up, heart rate goes up, uh, but as soon as this patient hits the anaerobic threshold, they start going into pump failure. You can see the stroke volume is actually falling as the heart rate is trying to compensate and starts to go up. You see a break here, it's a change in slope, but it starts to go up almost vertical here. So rapid, trying to make up for that failing stroke volume. That's kind of an interesting physiologic phenomenon, that one. Okay, but remember though, for the O2 pulse to reflect stroke volume, it has to assume that the arterial oxygen content minus the mixed venous is constant. Diseases that reduce this uh, subtracted value will also decrease the O2 pulse. And as we see that over here, we made that a constant, but it still can affect that number. So all, thing, all else being equal, it is an indirect measurement of stroke volume. Now another number we like to look at is the change in heart rate over the oxygen consumption throughout exercise. Here we take the maximum heart rate minus the heart rate at rest, and we divide it by the VO2 max minus the VO2 at rest. The value less than 50 is considered to be abnormal. Now notice though, this is really just kind of the inverse of the O2 pulse. The only difference is O2 pulse, we're looking at a spot value, where this is we're looking at a slope, the difference between rest and peak. It has all the same causes as a reduced oxygen or an O2 pulse, so it doesn't really help you a heck of a lot if one's low. Uh, slope can be increased in deconditioned subjects if they do stop at a suboptimal VO2, though. So you have to keep that in mind, too. Sometimes you can be fooled by that. Uh, another number we looked at is the VO2 divided by the work, the change. That's, again, a slope that we measure from when the work rate starts to the end of exercise. This is a number we have really good confidence intervals. If somebody has a slope that's less than 8.5, it's pretty indicative of pump failure. Again, all thing else, things else being equal. In other words, once you've ruled out severe anemia and you don't think they have a metabolic or neuromuscular disease, if that number is 8.5 or less in men or women, it's the same lower limit or low, a normal confidence limit, uh, that's a good sign of pump failure. Now, having said that, another caveat, if a patient is able to achieve a normal predicted VO2, at a very low workload, but it's still abnormal VO2, that's a pathognomonic finding of deconditioning and or obesity. Uh, kind of makes sense in the obesity part also because we're measuring watts on the bike, but if you have like a 300 pound person, 150 pounds overweight, that's like carrying four extra suitcases on their, their body when they're exercising, and you're not measuring that weight in the work. On the report, we're just seeing the workload of the cycle ergometer, not that extra 150 pounds added on. So that's another reason that the, uh, uh, they can have a very low workload with a normal VO2. Now, number here we're going to look at, this is the last number, is the VO2 in milliliters per minute divided by the kilogram. This is used prognostically uh, for pulmonary surgical risk that we'll talk about for pulmonary rehabilitation, and also it's a number used often in cardiac failure and transplant evaluations. Prognostic values lost, however, if patients run on pretty good doses of beta blockers, or if they've had any kind of resynchronization therapy, it kind of loses its value. Now, uh, this is actually come from a slide of a talk I presented at the ACCP uh, a couple years back, and how do we use the VO2 per kilogram? Uh, Oops, I'm missing a slide here. No. Oh, well. Anyway, how we use this is that uh, one of the caveats we have to keep track of is that are we looking at that number as the patient's VO2 per kilogram or VO2 per kilogram ideal body weight? Because remember, if patients really overweight, that ratio is going to be a lot lower. So here we're using this adjusted for per uh, ideal body weight. Um, now, exercise testing is recommended in patients that have an FEV1 less than 80% are predicted and have an FEV1 less than 1.5 liters if they're being considered for a lobectomy or less than 2 liters if they're considered for a uh, pneumonectomy. So where we start in this algorithm is if they're predicted post-op, remember post-op FEV1, is uh, or percent predicted post-op diffusion is less than 40 percent, it's recommended perform an exercise test. Now, if they do this test and their VO2 per kilogram is less than or equal to 10, that's considered a very poor prognosis and 
uh, patient probably will not survive. Very high risk group. At the other extreme, if their VO2 per kilogram is greater than or equal to 15, that's considered pretty good. They'll probably survive the, the operation without too much difficulty. It's this gray zone that gets to be a little bit problematic between the 10 to 15. Because then you have the issue, what if the patient just quit exercising early? And you try to get the best test, but they kind of wimped out on you. That's going to give them a very low number, and you might end up ruling them out for surgery when they really could have done better. If they're able to achieve a little bit better, maybe that would have been a much higher number. So we always have to keep that in mind, the quality testing. And that's one of the reasons that I think that these kind of tests should really only be performed by people with a lot of experience to know how to push the patients to get the maximum value. Uh, because this is where they often fall down on it in here just because of, of decreased effort. You have to get the most possible out of your patients. Now, the groups we're not going to talk about is patients that they have an FEV1 less than 30% of predicted, or an interesting number. If you take the FEV1% predicted post-op times the percent predicted post-op diffusion, but less than 1650, they fall into that high-risk category also. Uh, and, of course, if they have a uh, per percent predicted post-op FEV1, and percent predicted post-op diffusion greater than 40, again, you don't need to do an exercise test on that patient. Okay. Now, the cardiologists use this number a little bit differently than we do. They kind of have the same category down here. If they have a VO2 per kilogram less than or equal to 10, again, that's a pretty bad prognosis uh, on that patient. What they do, though, is they kind of try to take out that uh, factor of how good an effort the patient gave. They look at the respiratory quotient. Remember, that's the VCO2 divided by the VO2 because the more acidotic you get, the higher that number is. Well, they say if a patient hit an RQ 1.15, which indicates they're well beyond the anaerobic threshold, if they're greater than or equal to 1.15, they say that patient get a good test, that less than 10 number is real, and that patient has a very poor prognosis with heart failure, transplant, all this other stuff, they're in pretty, pretty uh, grim shape. Okay. Uh, if the respiratory quotient is less than 1.15, then they say, well, maybe that patient didn't push as hard as they really could have, and maybe their prognosis isn't quite as bad, and we have to kind of reassess some other things at this point. Now, in their in-between range, theirs is actually 10 to 18, while ours is 10 to 15, and they use the VE to VCO2 to help stratify that a little bit better. Maybe we should be using these numbers in that in-between category for pulmonary assessment to try to separate tease some of these guys out between the 10 to 15 range of where we might stratify them better. Now, they say if that patient's peak VE to VCO2 is greater than 34, that patient's going to die. Okay? Bad prognosis. Now, here's the problem with this. Remember how I told you that in most normal people, up to 34 to 35 is normal at AT? And then if they keep exercising, they get above 40, and then go up to 40, and it's still normal? Well, if you had a normal, healthy person, and you were basing on this cardiac stratification, and that patient's peak exercise is 38 or 39, perfectly normal, based on a cardiac, cardiac evaluation, you say, that guy's going to die. Okay? So the point I'm making here is you've got to be careful to use the correct literature for evaluating the correct patients. You know, I, I guess a good analogy is we do the same thing in pulmonary. Uh, like with the gold statement that we all love so dearly. You know, the gold statement was something that was made for assessing, stratifying, and managing COPD. It's a wonderful tool for that. But it's not meant to be using, used to interpret. If you say the FEV1 less than FEC, less than that is always COPD. Well, you know, we know a third of the normal population falls below 70%. They never smoked a day in their life. So you have to use it for the right situation. Uh, you can't use it to in, uh, interpret every disease in the world or pulmonary function test. The point I'm making here is these numbers are used in stratifying patients with congestive heart failure. It's only meant to be used for that. Um, okay, if the peak VE to VCO2 in these cardiac patients is less than 34, they fall into pretty good prognosis at that point. And again, if their uh, VO2 per kilogram ideal body weight is greater than or equal to 18, they're considered to be in pretty good shape. Okay, on the reports, we have our own little cardiac section that we're going to show you the heart rate, maximum predicted equation that we use is 210 minus 0.65 times age. We're going to show you the O2 pulse as it increases here. We're going to show you also the VO2 per kilogram, but I'm going to show it to you as both normal, or not normal, but as their actual body weight and their ideal body weight 
Notice in this patient who weighs 258 pounds here, VO2 per kilogram is actually 8.5. He'd be less than 10 if he was a heart failure patient and considered really bad shape. Okay. If he, if we take it for ideal body weight, notice now jumps from 8.5 to 13.6 falls into the intermediate risk category. So that's why I put in most, uh, both numbers. Also on the report, I'm going to show you what the patient's actual ideal body weight is. Part of the reason I do that here uh, is that the predicted values for VO2 that we use are different equations by the same author depending on if you're overweight or underweight on that one. So I will always show for the technicians the ideal body weight so they know which regression equation to manually put in. Uh, the machine's not capable of separating equations based on body weight, so we give them that information here. We're also going to show you the change in heart rate uh, over the VO uh, change in VO2 should be less than 50. We're going to show you the anaerobic threshold that we marked on the graph, and we're going to also show you the lower limit of normal based on adjusting for the patient's age. Remember, as they go up every decade, they go every five years, it goes up by 1%. Every two, uh, 10 years, it goes up by 2, up to about 75 or so, and then it plateaus around 50. We're going to show you the blood pressures. Uh, we always do the resting and peak blood pressure, even though we use a, an automatic cuff. We're always only going to report the manual pressures taken by the fellow at rest and at peak, not the cuff. We want to get an accurate one. Okay. So basically... What do we summarized about the non-pulmonary values here? Okay, we first identify if the anaerobic threshold is reduced. If it's less than 40, we know it's always abnormal, but otherwise we're going to adjust it for age. Uh, we have to systematically search for etiologies. Remember that little anatomy thing? You have to go all the way around the circle and come back again. Sometimes patients have multiple things going on simultaneously. Heart, lungs, metabolic, anemia, and organ failure. They can have the whole, whole shebang all at one time. The O2 pulse can reflect the stroke volume. Did it achieve a normal value? It's important to look at the tracings of the heart rate versus the O2 pulse. Does it continue to rise towards the end of exercise? Does it plateau? Does it plateau early? Uh, we look at the change in heart rate from rest to peak divided by the change in oxygen consumption rest to peak of greater than 50. We can see that in deconditioning, but also can be seen in cardiac disease and peripheral myopathies. The VO2, change in VO2, the slope divided by the change in work, work rate or workload. Uh, again, if it hits 8.5 or lower, that's pretty much pathognomonic for heart failure once you've excluded anemia and metabolic disorders. And then the VO2 per kilogram uh, we talked about, prognostically used in lung resection, patients with heart failure. Uh, heart failure, they usually need to associate it with the RQ and the EVCO2 to get a little more information out of it. Yes, Dan? Uh, I don't want to interrupt you. You had the chart that you just showed with the VO2. Um, the last value here, VO2 per mil per minute per uh -huh. program. There was one that said VO2 max greater than 15 was okay for lung infection <coughs> to the right. So low, yeah. not the low risk with VO2 in, in that box there, VO2 per mil per minute per kilogram greater than 15 is low risk. Right. There's a question in SEEK, in the current SEEK, about a lung cancer resection patient and the algorithm that they give is if it either if you do a if somebody's a candidate for a lobectomy and you calculate post op predicted FEV1 or DLCL and it's less than 60 then you do a CPAP and they have their low risk categories of VO2 greater than 20 and moderate between 10 and 20. Yeah I think you're talking about the equivalent of what I had in this slide here on here that if they fall outside of certain categories in here mm -hmm. uh, for example, the, the pre uh, predicted post-op FEV1s and things like taking some of the gymnastics of taking the, the numbers and multiplying by each other. In this case, uh, I showed you the percent predicted post-op FEV1 times percent predicted diffusion less than 1650. That's a real popular one on there. You don't need to mess around with those people at all. You just eliminate them right off the bat. So, uh, in other words, if you have this criteria, you do CPEP, but if they fall in one of these other ones, you don't think about it. This is, this is, I only was showing the algorithm where we kind of fall down into performing CPEP. <coughs> back up to here and okay we talked about that one already and the one thing we didn't talk about yet just to end things here is that make sure you look at the EKG also we didn't talk about that at all that's a whole nother uh, can of worms in there uh, 
when we perform exercise tests here, a lot of people on the outside will bill for both EKG interpretation and the pulmonary aspect. The fellows, when you go out, it's okay to do that, but just keep in mind, if you're going to do that, you have to have two separate interpretations for billing purposes to make it legal. And you get like twice the reimbursement for it for doing that. Part of the reason we don't do that commonly here is because most of these patients that we see have already had some form of stress test done, and it's almost like kind of like double billing again, so we just kind of ignore that aspect of it in the billing and kind of give it a pass on that one. Uh, but every now and then, though, it's important to look at this because, for example, we had a recent patient uh, uh, that everyone kind of missed. We had a patient who uh, looked like he got up to a maximum heart rate of like, actually it turned out it was like 210, and a guy's like 65 years old. And everybody said, oh, it got to be, you know, the predicted maximum there. Really good. Got up there. VO2 looked pretty good. But we went back and looked at the actual tracings on Friday when I got there. I said, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of a, and if you actually looked at the heart rate graphs, when he got up to about three quarters of his maximum area there, the heart rate just kind of went, the slope just went vertical all of a sudden. It jumped up suddenly. So when you see something like that, you go back, look at the tracings, and sure enough, the patient went into an SVT at that point. And, uh, and nobody picked up on it, which is kind of bypassing and stuff. And then went that way to the end of exercise. And then what we did is we kind of then went through each, the dynamic tracing, live tracing, as he started resting. And son of a gun, about a minute and a half later, he popped back into a sinus rhythm again. And uh, the guy that had previous tests by cardiology exercise tests, this kind of thing, uh, and, uh, and they completely missed it uh, on that. So uh, it's good to look at the EKGs as a last thing, too. I tend to want to glass over those, but they can be important. 